A Martian Odyssey by Stanley G. Weinbaum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. A Martian Odyssey by Stanley G. Weinbaum. Jarvis stretched himself as luxuriously as he could in the cramped general quarters of the Ares. Air you can breathe, he exulted. It feels as thick as soup after the thin stuff out there. He nodded at the Martian landscape stretching flat and desolate in the light of the nearer moon beyond the glass of the port. The other three stared at him sympathetically. Putz, the engineer, Leroy, the biologist, and Harrison, the astronomer and captain of the expedition. Dick Jarvis was chemist of the famous crew, the Ares expedition. First human beings to set foot on the mysterious neighbor of Earth, the planet Mars. This, of course, was in the old days, less than twenty years after the mad American Doney perfected the atomic blast at the cost of his life, and only a decade after the equally mad Cardozo rode it to the moon. They were true pioneers, these four of the Ares, except for a half-dozen moon expeditions in the ill-fated Delancey flight aimed at the seductive orb of Venus. They were the first men to feel other gravity than Earth's, and certainly the first successful crew to leave the Earth-Moon system. And they deserved that success when one considers the difficulties and discomforts, the months spent in acclimatization chambers back on Earth, learning to breathe the air as tenuous as that of Mars, the challenging of the void in the tiny rocket driven by the cranky reaction motors of the 21st century, and mostly the facing of an absolutely unknown world. Jarvis stretched and fingered the raw and peeling tip of his frostbitten nose. He sighed again contentedly. Well, exploded Harrison abruptly, are we going to hear what happened? You set out all shipshape in an auxiliary rocket, we don't get a peep for ten days, and finally Poots here picks you out of a lunatic ant heap with a freak ostrich as your pal. Spill it, man! Spiel? queried Leroy perplexedly. Spiel what? It means spiel, explained Poots soberly. It is to tell. Jarvis met Harrison's amused glance without the shadow of a smile. That's right, Carl, he said in grave agreement with Boots. Ich spiel es. He grunted comfortably and began. According to orders, he said, I watched Carl here take off toward the north, and then I got into my flying sweatbox and headed south. You'll remember, Cap, we had orders not to land, but just scout about for points of interest. I set the two cameras clicking and buzzed along, riding pretty high, about two thousand feet, for a couple of reasons. First, it gave the cameras a greater field, and second, the underjets travel so far in this half-vacuum they call air here that they stir up dust if you move low. We know all that from Poots, grunted Harrison. I wish you'd saved the films, though. They'd have paid for the cost of this junket. Remember how the public mobbed the first moon pictures? The films are safe, retorted Jarvis. Well, he resumed, as I said, I buzzed along at a pretty good clip. Just as we figured, the wings haven't much lift in this air at less than a hundred miles per hour, and even then I had to use the underjets. So with the speed and the altitude and the blurring caused by the underjets, the seeing wasn't any too good. I could see enough, though, to distinguish that what I sailed over was just more of this gray plane that we'd been examining the whole week since our landing. Same blobby growths and the same eternal carpet of crawling little plant animals, or biopods as Leroy calls them. So I sailed along calling back my position every hour as instructed, and not knowing whether you heard me. I did, snapped Harrison. A hundred and fifty miles south, continued Jarvis imperturbably, the surface changed to a sort of low plateau, nothing but desert and orange-tinted sand. I, I figured that we were right in our guess then, and this gray plain we dropped on was really the Mare Cimmerium which would make my orange desert the region called Xanthus. If I were right, I ought to hit another gray plain, the Mare Cronium, in another couple of hundred miles, and then another orange desert, Thule one or two. And so I did. Poots verified our position a week and a half ago, grumbled the captain. Let's get to the point. Coming, remarked Jarvis. Twenty miles into Thule, believe it or not, I crossed a canal. Poots photographed a hundred. Let's hear something new. And did he also see a city? Twenty of them, if you call those heaps of mud cities. Well, observed Jarvis, from here on I'll be telling a few things Poots didn't see. He rubbed his tingling nose and continued. I knew that I had sixteen hours of daylight at this season, so eight hours, eight hundred miles from here, I decided to turn back. I was still over Thule, whether one or two, I'm not sure, not more than twenty-five miles into it. And right there, 
Poots's pet motor quit. Quit? How? Poots was solicitous. The atomic blast got weak. I started losing altitude right away, and suddenly there I was with a thump right in the middle of Thule. Smashed my nose on the window, too. He rubbed the injured member ruefully. Did you maybe try washing their combustion chamber mit acid sulfuric? inquired Poots. Sometimes their leads gives a secondary radiation. Nah, said Jarvis disgustedly. I wouldn't try that. Of course, not more than ten times. Besides, the bump flattened the landing gear and busted off the underjets. Suppose I got the thing working. What then? Ten miles with the blast coming right out of the bottom, I'd have melted the floor from under me. He rubbed his nose again. Lucky for me, a pound only weighs seven ounces here, or I'd have been mashed flat. I could have fixed, ejaculated the engineer. I bet it was not serious. Probably not, agreed Jarvis sarcastically, only it wouldn't fly. Nothing serious, but I had my choice of waiting to be picked up or trying to walk back. Eight hundred miles, and perhaps twenty days before we had to leave. Forty miles a day. Well, he concluded, I chose to walk. Just as much chance of being picked up, and it kept me busy. We'd have found you, said Harrison. No doubt. Anyway, I rigged up a harness from some seat straps, and put the water tank on my back, took a cartridge belt and revolver and some iron rations, and started out. Water tank? exclaimed the little biologist Leroy. She weigh one quarter ton. Wasn't full. Weighed about 250 pounds earth weight, which is 85 here. Then, besides, my own personal 210 pounds is only 70 on Mars, so tank and all I grossed 155, or 55 pounds less than my everyday earth weight. I figured on that when I undertook the 40-mile daily stroll. Oh, of course I took a thermoskin sleeping bag for those wintry Martian nights. Off I went, bouncing along pretty quickly. Eight hours of daylight meant 20 miles or more. It got tiresome, of course, plugging along over a soft sand desert with nothing to see, not even Leroy's crawling biopods, but an hour or so brought me to the canal. Just a dry ditch about 400 feet wide and straight as a railroad on its own company map. There had been water in it some time, though. The ditch was covered with what looked like a nice green lawn. Only as I approached, the lawn moved out of my way. Eh? said Leroy. Yeah, it was a relative of your biopods. I caught one, a little grass-like blade about as long as my finger with two thin, stemmy legs. He is where? Leroy was eager. He is let go. I had to move, so I plowed along with the walking grass opening in front and closing behind, and then I was out on the orange desert of Thule again. I plugged steadily along, cussing the sand that made going so tiresome, and incidentally cussing that cranky motor of yours, Carl. It was just before twilight that I reached the edge of Thule, and looked down over the gray Mare Cronium, and I knew there was seventy-five miles of that to be walked over, and then a couple hundred miles of Xanthus Desert, and about as much more Mare Cimmerium. Was I pleased? I started cussing you fellows for not picking me up. We were trying, you sap, said Harrison. That didn't help. Well, I figured I might as well use what was left of daylight in getting down the cliff that bounded Thule. I found an easy place, and down I went. Mare Cronium was just the same sort of place as this. Crazy leafless plants, a bunch of crawlers. I gave it a glance and hauled out my sleeping bag. Up to that time, you know, I hadn't seen anything worth worrying about on this half-dead world. Nothing dangerous, that is. Did you? queried Harrison. Did I? You'll hear about it when I come to it. Well, I was just about to turn in when suddenly I heard the wildest sort of shenanigans. What is shenanigans? inquired Putz. He say, je ne sais quoi, explained Leroy. It is to say, I don't know what. That's right, agreed Jarvis. I didn't know what. So I sneaked over to find out. There was a racket, like a flock of crows eating a bunch of canaries. Whistles, cackles, calls, trills, and what have you. I rounded a clump of stumps, and there was Tweel. Tweel? asked Harrison. And Tweel? asked Leroy and Putz. That freak ostrich, explained the narrator. At least Tweel is as near as I can pronounce it without sputtering. He called it something like Terwirl. What was he doing? asked the captain. He was being eaten, and squealing, of course, as anyone would. Eaten? By what? I found out later. All I could see then was a bunch of black ropey arms tangled around what looked like, as Poots described it to you, an ostrich. 
I wasn't going to interfere. Naturally, if both creatures were dangerous, I'd have one less to worry about. But the bird-like thing was putting up a good battle, dealing vicious blows with an 18-inch beak between screeches. And besides, I caught a glimpse or two of what was on the end of those arms. Jarvis shuddered. But the clincher was when I noticed a little black bag or case hung about the neck of the bird thing. It was intelligent. That or tame, I assumed. Anyway, it clinched my decision. I pulled out my automatic and fired into what I could see of its antagonist. There was a flurry of tentacles and a spurt of black corruption, and then the thing with a disgusting sucking noise pulled itself and its arms into a hole in the ground. The other let out a series of clacks, staggered around on legs about as thick as golf sticks, and turned suddenly to face me. I held my weapon ready, and the two of us stared at each other. The Martian wasn't a bird, really. It wasn't even bird-like, except just at first glance. It had a beak, all right, and a few feathery appendages. But the beak wasn't really a beak. It was somewhat flexible. I could see the tip bend slowly from side to side. It was almost like a cross between a beak and a trunk. It had four-toed feet and four-fingered things, hands you'd have to call them, and a little roundish body, and a, and a long neck ending in a tiny head, and that beak. It stood an inch or so taller than I, and, well, Boots saw it. The engineer nodded. Ja, I saw. Jarvis continued. So, we stared at each other. Finally, the creature went into a series of clackings and twitterings and held out its hands towards me, empty. I took that as a gesture of friendship. Perhaps, suggested Harrison, it looked at that nose of yours and thought you were its brother. Huh. <laughs> you can be funny without talking. Anyway... I put up my gun and said, Ah, uh, don't mention it or something of the sort, and the thing came over and we were pals. By that time the sun was pretty low and I knew that I'd better build a fire or get into my thermo skin. I decided on the fire. I picked a spot at the base of the Thule cliff where the rock could reflect a little heat on my back. I started breaking off chunks of this desiccated Martian vegetation and my companion caught the idea and brought in an armful. I reached for a match, but the Martian fished into his pocket and brought out something that looked like a glowing coal. One touch of it, and the fire was blazing. And you all know what a job we have starting a fire in this atmosphere. And that bag of his, continued the narrator, that was a manufactured article, my friends. Press an end, and she popped open. Press the middle, and she sealed so perfectly you couldn't see the line. Better than zippers. Well, we stared at the fire a while, and I decided to attempt some sort of communication with the Martian. I pointed at myself and said, Dick. He caught the drift immediately, stretched a bony claw at me, and repeated, Tick. Then I pointed at him, and he gave that whistle I call Tweel. I can't imitate his accent, but things were going pretty smoothly. To emphasize the names, I repeated Dick, and then pointing at him, Tweel. There we stuck. He gave some clacks that sounded negative and said something like p, -p, p prut and that was just the beginning. I was always tick, but as for him, part of the time he was tweel, and part of the time he was p, -p, -p prut and part of the time he was sixteen other noises. We just couldn't connect. I tried rock, and I tried star, and tree, and fire, and lord knows what else, and try as I would, I couldn't get a single word. Nothing was the same for two successive minutes. And if that's a language, I'm an alchemist. Finally, I gave it up and called him Tweel, and that seemed to do. But Tweel hung on to some of my words. He remembered a couple of them, which I suppose is a great achievement if you're used to a language you have to make up as you go along. But I couldn't get the hang of his talk. Either I missed some subtle point, or we just didn't think alike. And I rather believe the latter view. I have other reasons for believing that. After a while, I gave up the language business and tried mathematics. I scratched 2 plus 2 equals 4 on the ground and demonstrated it with pebbles. Again, Tweel caught the idea and informed me that 3 plus 3 equals 6. Once more, we seemed to be getting somewhere. So knowing that Tweel had at least a grammar school education, I drew a circle for the sun, pointing first at it and then at the last glow of the sun. Then I sketched in Mercury and Venus and Mother Earth and Mars, and finally pointing to Mars, I swept my hand around in a sort of inclusive gesture to indicate that Mars was our current environment. 
I was working up to putting over the idea that my home was on Earth. Tweel understood my diagram all right. He poked his beak at it, and with a great deal of trilling and clucking he added Deimos and Phobos to Mars, and then sketched in the Earth's moon. Do you see what that proves? It proves that Tweel's race uses telescopes, that they're civilized. Does not, snapped Harrison. The moon is visible from here as a fifth magnitude star. They could see its revolution with the naked eye. The moon, yes, said Jarvis. You've missed my point. Mercury isn't visible, and Tweel knew of Mercury because he placed the moon at the third planet, not the second. If he didn't know Mercury, he'd put the Earth second and Mars third instead of fourth. See? Huh, <laughs> said Harrison. Anyway, proceeded Jarvis, I went on with my lesson. Things were going smoothly, and it looked as if I could put the idea over. I pointed at the earth on my diagram, and then at myself, and then to clinch it, I pointed to myself, and then to the earth itself, shining bright green, almost at the zenith. Tweel set up such an excited clacking that I was certain he understood. He jumped up and down, and suddenly he pointed at himself, and then at the sky, and then at himself, and then at the sky again. He pointed at his middle, and then Arcturus, at his head, and then at Spica at his feet, and then a half a dozen stars, while I just gaped at him. Then, all of a sudden, he gave a tremendous leap. Man, what a hop! He shot straight up into the starlight, seventy-five feet if an inch. I saw him silhouetted against the sky, saw him turn and come down at me head first, and land smack on his beak like a javelin. There he stuck, square in the center of my sun circle, in the sand. A bullseye. Nuts, observed the captain. Plain nuts. That's what I thought, too. I just stared at him open-mouthed while he pulled his head out of the sand and stood up. Then I figured he'd missed my point, and I went through the whole blamed rigmarole again, and it ended the same way, with Tweel on his nose in the middle of my picture. Maybe it's a religious rite, suggested Harrison. Maybe, said Jarvis dubiously. Well, there we were. We could exchange ideas up to a certain point, and then, bluey. Something in us was different, unrelated. I don't doubt that Tweel thought me just as screwy as I thought him. Our minds simply looked at the world from different viewpoints, and perhaps his viewpoint is as true as ours. But we couldn't get together, and that's all. Yet in spite of all difficulties, I liked Tweel, and I have a queer certainty that he liked me. Nuts, repeated the captain, just daffy. Yeah, wait and see. A couple of times I thought that perhaps we... He paused, and then resumed his narrative. Anyway, I finally gave it up and got into my thermoskin to sleep. The fire hadn't kept me any too warm, but that damn sleeping bag did. Got stuffy five minutes after I'd closed myself in. I opened it a little and bingo, some eighty below zero air hit my nose, and that's when I got this pleasant little frostbite to add to the bump I acquired during the crash of my rocket. I don't know what Tweel made of my sleeping. He sat around, but when I woke up, he was gone. I'd just crawled out of my bag, though, when I heard some twittering, and there he came, sailing down from that three-story Thule cliff to a light on his beak beside me. I pointed to myself and toward the north, and he pointed at himself and toward the south. But when I loaded up and started away, he came along. Man, how he traveled! A hundred and fifty feet at a jump! sailing through the air stretched out like a spear and landing on his beak. He seemed surprised at my plotting, but after a few moments he fell in beside me. Only every few minutes he'd go into one of his leaps and stick his nose into the sand a block ahead of me. Then he'd come shooting back at me. It made me nervous at first to see that beak of his coming at me like a spear, but he always ended in the sand at my side. So the two of us plugged along across the Mare Cronium. Same sort of place as this, same crazy plants and same little green biopods growing in the sand or crawling out of your way. We talked, not that we understood each other, you know, but just for company. I sang songs, and I suspect Tweel did too. At least some of his trillings and twitterings had a subtle sort of rhythm. Then for variety, Tweel would display his smattering of English words. He'd point to an outcropping and say, rock, and point to a pebble and say it again or he'd touch my arm and say, tick, and then repeat it. He seemed terrifically amused that the same word meant the same thing twice in succession. 
or that the same word could apply to two different objects. It set me wondering if perhaps his language wasn't like the primitive speech of some Earth people, you know, Captain, like the Negritos, for instance, who haven't any generic words, no word for food or water or man, but words for good food and bad food or rainwater and seawater or strong man and weak man, but no names for general classes. They're too primitive to understand that rainwater and seawater are just different aspects of the same thing. But that wasn't the case with Tweel. It was just that we were somehow mysteriously different. Our minds were alien to each other, and yet we liked each other. Looney, that's all, remarked Harrison. That's why you two were so fond of each other. Well, I like you, countered Jarvis wickedly. Anyway, he resumed, don't get the idea that there was anything screwy about Tweel. In fact, I'm not so sure but that he couldn't teach our highly praised human intelligence a trick or two. Oh, he wasn't an intellectual superman, I guess. But don't overlook the point that he managed to understand a little of my mental workings, and I never even got a glimmering of his. Because he didn't have any, suggested the captain, while Putz and Leroy blinked attentively. You can judge of that when I'm through, said Jarvis. Well, we plugged along across the Mare Cronium all that day and all the next. Mare Cronium, Sea of Time. Say, I was willing to agree with Schiaparelli's name by the end of that march. Just that gray, endless plain of weird plants and never a sign of any other life. It was so monotonous that I was even glad to see the desert of Xanthus toward the evening of the second day. I was fair worn out. But Tweel seemed as fresh as ever. For all, I never saw him drink or eat. I think he could have crossed the Mare Cronium in a couple of hours with those block-long nose-dives of his, but he stuck along with me. I offered him some water once or twice. He took the cup from me and sucked the liquid into his beak and then carefully squirted it all back into the cup and gravely returned it. Just as we sighted Xanthus, or the cliffs that bounded it, one of those nasty sand clouds blew along. Not as bad as the one we had here, but mean to travel against. I pulled the transparent flap of my thermoskin bag across my face and managed pretty well, and I noticed that Tweel used some feathery appendages growing like a mustache at the base of his beak to cover his nostrils, and some similar fuzz to shield his eyes. He is a desert creature, ejaculated the little biologist Leroy. Huh? Why? He drink no water. He is a dap for sans storm. Proves nothing. There's not enough water to waste anywhere on this desiccated pill called Mars. We'd call all of it desert on Earth, you know. He paused. Anyway, after the sandstorm blew over, a little wind kept blowing in our faces. Not strong enough to stir the sand, but suddenly things came drifting along from the Xanthus cliffs. Small, transparent spheres for all the world like glass tennis balls. But light. They were almost light enough to float even in this thin air. Empty, too. At least I cracked open a couple and nothing came out but a bad smell. I asked Tweel about them, but all he said was no, 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 which I took to mean that he knew nothing about them. So they went bouncing by like tumbleweeds or like soap bubbles, and we plugged on towards Xanthus. Tweel pointed at one of the crystal balls once and said, Rock! But I was too tired to argue with him. Later I discovered what he meant. We came to the bottom of the Xanthus Cliffs finally when there wasn't much daylight left. I decided to sleep on the plateau if possible. Anything dangerous, I reasoned, would be more likely to prowl through the vegetation of the Mare Cronium than the sand of Xanthus. Not that I'd seen a single sign of menace except the rope-armed black thing that had trapped Tweel, and apparently that didn't prowl at all but lured its victims within reach. It couldn't lure me while I slept, especially as Tweel didn't seem to sleep at all, but simply sat patiently around all night. I wondered how the creature had managed to trap Tweel, but there wasn't any way of asking him. I found that out, too, later. It's devilish. However, we were ambling around the base of the Xanthus Barrier looking for an easy spot to climb. At least I was. Tweel could have leapt it easily, for the cliffs were lower than Thule, perhaps sixty feet. I found a place and started up, swearing at the water tank strapped to my back. It didn't bother me except when climbing, and suddenly I heard a sound that I thought I recognized. You know how deceptive sounds are in this thin air. A shot sounds like the pop of a cork, 
But this sound was the drone of a rocket, and sure enough, there went our second auxiliary, about ten miles westward, between me and the sunset. Was me, said Putz. I hummed for you. Yeah, I knew that, but what good did it do me? I hung on to the cliff and yelled and waved with one hand. Tweel saw it, too, and set up a trilling and twittering, leaping to the top of the barrier and then high into the air, and while I watched, the machine droned on into the shadows to the south. I scrambled to the top of the cliff. Tweel was still pointing and trilling excitedly, shooting up toward the sky and coming down head-on to stick upside down on his beak in the sand. I pointed toward the south and at myself, and he said, yes, 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 but somehow I gathered that he thought the flying thing was a relative of mine, probably a parent. Perhaps I did his intellect an injustice. I think now that I did. I was bitterly disappointed by the failure to attract attention. I pulled out my thermos skin bag and crawled into it as the night chill was already apparent. Tweel stuck his beak into the sand and drew up his legs and arms and looked for all the world like one of those leafless shrubs out there. I think he stayed that way all night. Protective mimicry, ejaculated Leroy. See, he is a desert creature. In the morning, resumed Jarvis, we started off again. We hadn't gone a hundred yards into Xanthus when I saw something queer. Uh, this is one thing Poots didn't photograph, I'll wager. There was a line of little pyramids, tiny ones, not more than six inches high, stretching across Xanthus as far as I could see. Little buildings made of pygmy bricks. They were hollow inside and truncated, or at least broken at the top, and empty. I pointed at them and said, what, to Tweel, but he gave some negative twitters to indicate, I suppose, that he didn't know. So off we went, following the row of pyramids, because they ran north and I was going north. Man, we trailed that line for hours. After a while, I noticed another queer thing. They were getting larger. Same number of bricks in each one, but the bricks were larger. By noon, they were shoulder high. I looked into a couple, all just the same, broken at the top and empty. I examined a brick or two as well. They were silica and old as creation itself. How you know? asked Leroy. They were weathered, edges rounded. Silica doesn't weather easily, even on Earth, and in this climate... How old do you think? Fifty thousand, a hundred thousand years? How can I tell? The little ones we saw in the morning were older, perhaps ten times as old, crumbling. How old would that make them? Ha half a million years? Who knows? Jarvis paused a moment. Well, he resumed, we followed the line. Tweel pointed at them and said rock once or twice, but he'd done that many times before. Besides, he was more or less right about these. I tried questioning him. I pointed at a pyramid and asked people, and indicated the two of us. He set up a negative sort of clucking and said, no, 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 no one, one, two, no two, two, four. Meanwhile, rubbing his stomach. I just stared at him, and he went through the business again. No one, one, two, no two, two, four. I just gaped at him. That proves it, exclaimed Harrison. Nuts. You think so? queried Jarvis sardonically. Well, I figured it out different. No one, one, two? You don't get it, of course, do you? Nope. Nor do you. I think I do. Tweel was using the few English words he knew to put over a very complex idea. What, let me ask, does mathematics make you think of? Why, astronomy, or, or logic? That's it. No one, one, two. Tweel was telling me that the builders of the pyramids weren't people, or that they weren't intelligent, that they weren't reasoning creatures. Get it? Huh. I'll be damned. You probably will. Why? Put in Leroy. He rub his belly. Why? Because, my dear biologist, that's where his brains are. Not in his tiny head. In his middle. C'est impossible. Not on Mars, it isn't. This flora and fauna aren't earthly. Your biopods prove that. Jarvis grinned and took up his narrative. Anyway, we plugged along across Xanthus, and in about the middle of the afternoon, something else queer happened. The pyramids ended. Ended? Yep. Yeah, the queer part was that the last one, and now they were ten-footers, was capped. See? Whatever built it was still inside. We'd trailed them from their half-million-year-old origin to the present. Tweel and I noticed it about the same time. I yanked out my automatic. I had a clip of Boland explosive bullets in it. And Tweel, 
quick as a sleight of hand trick, snapped a queer little glass revolver out of his bag. It was much like our weapons, except that the grip was larger to accommodate his four-taloned hand, and we held our weapons ready while we sneaked up along the lines of empty pyramids. Tweel saw the movement first. The top tiers of bricks were heaving, shaking, and suddenly slid down the sides with a thin crash. And then something, something was coming out. A long silvery gray arm appeared, dragging after it an armored body. Armored, I mean, with scales, silver gray and dull shining. The arm heaved the body out of the hole. The beast crashed to the sand. It was a nondescript creature, body like a big gray cask arm and a sort of mouth hole at one end, stiff pointed tail at the other, and that's all. No other limbs, no eyes, ears, nose, nothing. The thing dragged itself a few yards, inserted its pointed tail in the sand, pushed itself upright, and just sat. Tweel and I watched for ten minutes before it moved. Then, with a creaking and rustling like, oh, like crumpling stiff paper, its arm moved to the mouth hole, and out came a brick. The arm placed the brick carefully on the ground and the thing was still again. Another ten minutes, another brick. Just one of nature's bricklayers. I was about to slip away and move on when Tweel pointed at the thing and said, Rock. I went, Huh? And he said it again. Then to the accompaniment of some of his trilling, he said, No, no, and gave two or three whistling breaths. Well, I got his meaning for a wonder. I said, No breath? And demonstrated the word. Tweel was ecstatic. He said, yes, 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 no, 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 breet. Then he gave a leap and sailed out to land on his nose about one pace from the monster. I was startled, you can imagine. The arm was going up for a brick and I expected to see Tweel caught and mangled, but nothing happened. Tweel pounded on the creature and the arm took the brick and placed it neatly beside the first. Tweel rapped on its body again and said, rock. I got up nerve enough to take a look myself. Tweel was right again. The creature was rock and it didn't breathe. How you know, snapped Leroy, his black eyes blazing interest. Because I'm a chemist. The beast was made of silica. There must have been pure silicon in the sand, and it lived on that, get it? We and Tweel and those plants out there and even the biopods are carbon life. This thing lived by a different set of chemical reactions. It was silicon life. La vie silicius, shouted Leroy. I have suspect, and now it is proof. I must go see. Il fait que je... All right, all right, said Jarvis. You can go see. Anyhow, there the thing was, alive and yet not alive, moving every ten minutes and then only to remove a brick. Those bricks were its waste matter, see, Frenchy? We're carbon, and our waste is carbon dioxide. And this thing is silicon, and its waste is silicon dioxide. Silica. But silica is solid hence the bricks, and it builds itself in, and when it's covered, it moves over to a fresh place to start over. No wonder it creaked, a living creature half a million years old. How you know how old? Leroy was frantic. We trailed its pyramids from the beginning, didn't we? If this weren't the original pyramid builder, the series would have ended somewhere before we found him, wouldn't it? Ended and started over with the small ones. That's simple enough, isn't it? But he reproduces, or tries to. Before the third brick came out, there was a little rustle and out popped a whole stream of those little crystal balls. They're his spores or eggs or seeds, call them what you want. They went bouncing by across Xanthus just as they'd bounced by us back in the Mare Cronium. I have a hunch how they work too. This is for your information, Leroy. I think the crystal shell of silica is no more than a protective covering like an eggshell and that the active principle is the smell inside. It's some sort of gas that attacks silicon, and if the shell is broken near a supply of that element, some reaction starts that ultimately develops into a beast, like that one. You should try, exclaimed the little Frenchman. We must break one to see. Yeah, well, I did. I smashed a couple against the sand. Would you like to come back in about 10,000 years to see if I planted some pyramid monsters? You'd most likely be able to tell by that time. Jarvis paused and drew a deep breath. Lord, that queer creature. Do you picture it? Blind, deaf, nerveless, brainless, just a mechanism, and yet immortal. Bound to go on making bricks, building pyramids as long as silicon and oxygen exist, and even afterwards, it'll just stop. It won't be dead. If the accidents of a million years bring it its food again, there it'll be, ready to run again. 
while brains and civilizations are part of the past. A queer beast, yet I met a stranger one. If you did, it must have been in your dreams, growled Harrison. You're right, said Jarvis soberly. In a way, you're right. The dream beast. That's the best name for it. And it's the most fiendish, terrifying creation one could imagine. More dangerous than a lion. More insidious than a snake. Tell me, begged Leroy. I must go see. Not this devil, he paused again. Well, he resumed, Tweel and I left the pyramid creature and plowed along through Xanthus. I was tired and a little disheartened by Poots's failure to pick me up, and Tweel's trilling got on my nerves, as did his flying nose dives. So I just strode along without a word, hour after hour, across that monotonous desert. Toward mid-afternoon we came in sight of a low dark line on the horizon. I knew what it was. was, fancy long, standing plain as day under one of those crack-brained trees and smiling and waving just the way I remember her when we left. Now you're nuts too, observed the captain. Boy, I almost agreed with you. I stared and pinched myself and closed my eyes and then stared again and every time there was fancy long, smiling and waving. Tweel saw something too. He was trilling and clucking away, but I scarcely heard him. I was bounding toward her over the sand, too amazed to even ask myself questions. I wasn't twenty feet from her when Tweel caught me with one of his flying leaps. He grabbed my arm, yelling, No, 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 in his squeaky voice. I tried to shake him off. He was as light as if he were built of bamboo. But he dug his claws in and yelled, and finally some sort of sanity returned to me, and I stopped less than ten feet from her. There she stood, looking as solid as Poots's head. What? said the engineer. She smiled and waved and waved and smiled, and I stood there dumb as Leroy, while Tweel squeaked and chattered. I knew it couldn't be real, yet there she was. Finally I said, Fancy! Fancy long! She just kept on smiling and waving, but looking as real as if I hadn't left her thirty-seven million miles away. Tweel had his glass pistol out, pointing it at her. I grabbed his arm, but he tried to push me away. He pointed at her and said, No breet, no breet, and I understood that he meant that the fancy long thing wasn't alive. Man, my head was whirling. Still, it gave me the jitters to see him pointing his weapon at her. I don't know why I stood there watching him take careful aim, but I did. Then he squeezed the handle of his weapon. There was a little puff of steam, and Fancy Long was gone, and in her place was one of those writhing black rope-armed horrors like the one I'd saved Tweel from. The Dream Beast. I stood there dizzy, watching it die while Tweel trilled and whistled. Finally he touched my arm, pointed at the twisting thing, and said, You one one two. He one one two. After he'd repeated it eight or ten times, I got it. Do any of you? Oui, shrilled Leroy. Moi, je le comprends. He mean you think of something the beast he know, and you see it. Un chien, a hungry dog, he would see the big bone with meat, or smell it, not? Right, said Jarvis. The dream beast uses its victim's longings and desires to trap its prey. The bird at nesting season would see its mate. The fox prowling for its prey would see a helpless rabbit. How he do? queried Leroy. How do I know? How does a snake back on earth charm a bird into its very jaws? And aren't there deep-sea fish that lure their victims into their mouths? Lord, Jarvis shuddered, do you see how insidious the monster is? We're warned now, but henceforth we can't trust even our eyes. You might see me, I might see one of you, and back of it may be nothing but another of those black horrors. 
"'How'd your friend know?' asked the captain abruptly. "'Tweel? I wonder. Perhaps he was thinking of something that couldn't possibly have interested me, and when I started to run he realized that I saw something different and was warned. Or perhaps the Dream Beast can only project a single vision and Tweel saw what I saw, or nothing. I couldn't ask him, but it's just another proof that his intelligence is equal to ours or greater." "'He's Daffy, I tell you,' said Harrison. "'What makes you think his intellect ranks with the human?' "'Plenty of things. First, the Pyramid Beast. He hadn't seen one before. He said as much. Yet he recognized it as a dead, alive automaton of silicon. He could have heard of it, objected Harrison. He lives around here, you know. Well, how about the language? I couldn't pick up a single idea of his, and he learned six or seven words of mine. And do you realize what complex ideas he put over with no more than those six or seven words? The, the pyramid monster, the dream beast. In a single phrase, he told me that one was a harmless automaton and the other a deadly hypnotist. What about that? Huh, said the captain. Huh, if you wish. Could you have done it knowing only six words of English? Could you go even further as Tweel did and tell me that another creature was of a sort of intelligence so different from ours that understanding was impossible, even more impossible than that between Tweel and me? Eh? What was that? Later. The point I'm making is that Tweel and his race are worthy of our friendship. Somewhere on Mars, and you'll find I'm right, is a civilization and culture equal to ours, and maybe more than equal. And communication is possible between them and us. Tweel proves that. It may take years of patient trial, for their minds are alien, but less alien than the next minds we encountered, if they are minds. The next ones? What next ones? The people of the mud cities along the canals. Jarvis frowned, then resumed his narrative. I thought the Dream Beast and the Silicon Monster were the strangest beings conceivable, but I was wrong. These creatures are still more alien, less understandable than either, and far less comprehensible than Tweel, with whom friendship is possible, and even by patience and concentration, the exchange of ideas. Well, he continued, we left the Dream Beast dying, dragging itself back into its hole, and we moved towards the canal. There was a carpet of that queer walking grass scampering out of our way, and when we reached the bank there was a yellow trickle of water flowing. The mound city I'd noticed from the rocket was a mile or so to the right, and I was curious enough to want to take a look at it. It had seemed deserted from my previous glimpse of it, and if any creatures were lurking in it, well, Tweel and I were both armed. And by the way, that crystal weapon of Tweel's was an interesting device. I took a look at it after the Dream Beast episode. It fired a little glass splinter, poisoned, I suppose, and I guess it held at least a hundred of them to a load. The propellant was steam, just plain steam. Steam? echoed Poots. From what come steam? From water, of course. You could see the water through the transparent handle and about a gill of another liquid, thick and yellowish. When Tweel squeezed the handle, there was no trigger, a drop of water and a drop of the yellow stuff squirted into the firing chamber, and the water vaporized. Pop! Like that. It's not so difficult. I think we could develop the same principle. Concentrated sulfuric acid will heat water almost to boiling, and so will quicklime, and there's potassium and sodium. Of course, his weapon hadn't the range of mine, but it wasn't so bad in this thin air, and it did hold as many shots as a cowboy's gun in a western movie. It was effective, too, at least against Martian life. I tried it out, aiming it at one of the crazy plants, and darned if the plant didn't wither up and fall apart. That's why I think the glass splinters were poisoned. Anyway, we trudged along toward the mud heap city, and I began to wonder whether the city builders dug the canals. I pointed to the city and then at the canal, and Tweel said, No, 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 and gestured toward the south. I took it to mean that some other race had created the canal system, perhaps Tweel's people. I, I don't know. Maybe there's still another intelligent race on the planet, or a dozen others. Mars is a queer little world. A hundred yards from the city we crossed a sort of road, just a hard-packed mud trail, and then, all of a sudden, along came one of the mound builders. Man, talk about fantastic beings. It looked rather like a barrel trotting along on four legs with four other arms or tentacles. It had no head, just body and members and a row of eyes completely around it. The top end of the barrel body was a diaphragm stretched as tight as a drumhead, and that was all. 
It was pushing a little coppery cart and tore right past us like the proverbial bat out of hell. It didn't even notice us, although I thought the eyes on my side shifted a little as it passed. A, a moment later, another came along, pushing another empty cart. Same thing. It just scooted past us. Well, I wasn't going to be ignored by a bunch of barrels playing train. So when the third one approached, I planted myself in the way. Ready to jump, of course, if the thing didn't stop. But it did. It stopped and set up a sort of drumming from the diaphragm on top. I held out both hands and said, We are friends. And what do you suppose the thing did? Said pleased to meet you, I'll bet, suggested Harrison. I couldn't have been more surprised if it had. It drummed on its diaphragm and then suddenly boomed out, We are friends, and gave its pushcart a vicious poke at me. I jumped aside and away it went while I stared dumbly after it. A minute later another one came hurrying along. This one didn't pause, but simply drummed out, We are friends, and scurried by. How did it learn the phrase? Were all the creatures in some sort of communication with each other? Were they all parts of some central organism? I, I don't know, though I think Tweel does. Anyway, the creatures went sailing past us, everyone greeting us with the same statement. It got to be funny. I never thought to find so many friends on this godforsaken ball. Finally, I made a puzzled gesture to Tweel. I guess he understood, for he said, one, one, two, yes, two, two, four, no. Get it? Sure, said Harrison. It's a Martian nursery rhyme. Yeah, well, I was getting used to Tweel's symbolism, and I figured it out this way. One, one, two, yes, the creatures were intelligent. Two, two, four, no, their intelligence was not of our order, but something different and beyond the logic of two and two is four. Maybe I missed his meaning. Perhaps he meant that their minds were of low degree, able to figure out the simple things, one, one, two, yes, but not more difficult things, two, two, four, no. But I think from what we saw later that he meant the other. After a few moments, the creatures came rushing back, first one, then another. Their pushcarts were full of stones, sand, chunks of rubbery plants, and such rubbish as that. They droned out their friendly greeting, which didn't really sound so friendly, and dashed on. The third one I assumed to be my first acquaintance, and I decided to have another chat with him. I stepped into his path again and waited. Up he came, booming out his, We are friends, and stopped. I looked at him. Four or five of his eyes looked at me. He tried his password again and gave a shove on his cart, but I stood firm. And then the dashed creature reached out one of his arms and two finger-like nippers tweaked my nose. Ha! roared Harrison. Maybe the things have a sense of beauty. Laugh, grumbled Jarvis. I'd already had a nasty bump and a mean frostbite on that nose. Anyway, I yelled, Ouch! and jumped aside and the creature dashed away. But from then on, their greeting was, We are friends. Ouch! Queer beasts. Tweel and I followed the road squarely up to the nearest mound. The creatures were coming and going, paying us not the slightest attention, fetching their loads of rubbish. The road simply divided into an opening and slanted down like an old mine, and in and out darted the barrel people, greeting us with their eternal phrase. I looked in. There was a light somewhere below, and I was curious to see it. It didn't look like a flame or torch, you understand, but more like a civilized light, and I thought that I might get some clue as to the creature's development. So in I went, and Tweel tagged along, not without a few trills and twitters, however. The light was curious. It sputtered and flared like an old arc light, but came from a single black rod set in the wall of the corridor. It was electric beyond doubt. The creatures were fairly civilized, apparently. Then I saw another light shining on something that glittered, and I went on to look at that. But it was only a heap of shiny sand. I turned toward the entrance to leave, and the devil take me if it was gone. I suppose the corridor had curved, or I'd stepped into a side passage. Anyway, I'd walked back in that direction I thought we'd come, and all I saw was more dim-lit corridor. The place was a labyrinth. There was nothing but twisting passages running every way, lit by occasional lights and now and then a creature running by, sometimes with a pushcart, sometimes without. Well, I, I wasn't much worried at first. Tweel and I had only come a few steps from the entrance, but every move we made after that seemed to get us in deeper. 
Finally, I tried following one of the creatures with an empty cart, thinking that he'd be going out for his rubbish. But he ran around aimlessly into one passage and out another. When he started dashing around a pillar like one of those Japanese waltzing mice, I gave up, dumped my water tank on the floor, and sat down. Tweel was as lost as I. I pointed up, and he said, no, 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 in a sort of helpless trill. And we couldn't get any help from the natives. They paid no attention at all, except to assure us that they were friends. Ouch! Lord, I don't know how many hours or days we wandered around there. I slept twice from sheer exhaustion. Twill never seemed to need sleep. We tried following only the upward corridors, but they'd run uphill a ways and then curve downwards. The temperature in that damned ant hill was constant. You couldn't tell night from day, and after my first sleep I didn't know whether I'd slept one hour or thirteen, so I couldn't tell from my watch whether it was midnight or noon. We saw plenty of strange things. There were machines running in some of the corridors, but they didn't seem to be doing anything, just wheels turning. And several times I saw two barrel beasts, with a little one growing between them, joined to both. Parthenogenesis, exulted Leroy. Parthenogenesis by budding like le tulip. If you say so, Frenchy, agreed Jarvis. The things never noticed us at all, except, as I say, to greet us with, We are friends. Ouch! They seemed to have no home life of any sort, but just scurried around with their pushcarts bringing in rubbish. And finally I discovered what they did with it. We'd had a little luck with a corridor, one that slanted upwards for a great distance. I was feeling that we ought to be close to the surface when suddenly the passage debouched into a domed chamber, the only one we'd seen. And man, I felt like dancing when I saw what looked like daylight through a crevice in the roof. There was a, a sort of machine in the chamber, just an enormous wheel that turned slowly, and one of the creatures was in the act of dumping his rubbish below it. The wheel ground it with a crunch, sand, stones, plants, all into powder that sifted away somewhere. While we watched, others filed in, repeating the process. And that seemed to be all, no rhyme or reason to the whole thing. But that's characteristic of this crazy planet. And there was another fact that's almost too bizarre to believe. One of the creatures, having dumped his load, pushed his cart aside with a crash and calmly shoved himself under the wheel. I watched him being crushed, too stupefied to make a sound. And a moment later another followed him. They were perfectly methodical about it, too. Uh, one of the cartless creatures took the abandoned pushcart. Tweel didn't seem surprised. I pointed out the next suicide to him, and he just gave the most human-like shrug imaginable as much to say, what can I do about it? He must have known more or less about these creatures. Then I saw something else. There was something beyond the wheel, something shining on a sort of low pedestal. I walked over. There was a little crystal about the size of an egg fluorescing to beat Tophet. The light from it stung my hands and face, almost like a static discharge, and then I noticed another funny thing. Remember that wart I had on my left thumb? Look. Jarvis extended his hand. It dried up and fell off, just like that. And my abused nose? Say, the pain went out of it like magic. The thing had the property of hard x-rays or gamma radiations, only more so. It destroyed diseased tissue and left healthy tissue unharmed. I was thinking what a present that'd be to take back to Mother Earth when a lot of racket interrupted. We dashed back to the other side of the wheel in time to see one of the pushcarts ground up. Some suicide had been careless, it seems. Then suddenly the creatures were booming and drumming all around us, and their noise was decidedly menacing. A crowd of them advanced towards us. We backed out of what I thought was the passage we'd entered by, and they came rumbling after us, some pushing carts and some not. Crazy brutes! There was a whole chorus of, We are friends. Ouch! I didn't like the ouch. It was rather suggestive. Tweel had his glass gun out, and I dumped my water tank for greater freedom and got mine. We backed up the corridor with the barrel beasts following, about twenty of them. Queer thing. The ones coming in with loaded carts moved past us, inches away, without a sign. Tweel must have noticed that. Suddenly he snatched out that glowing coal cigar lighter of his and touched a cartload of plant limbs. Puff! The whole load was burning, and the crazy beast pushing it went right along without a change of pace. It created some disturbance among our friends, however, and then I noticed the smoke eddying and swirling past us, and sure enough, 
There was the entrance. I grabbed Tweel and out we dashed, and after us are twenty pursuers. The daylight felt like heaven. Though I saw at first glance that the sun was all but set, and that was bad, since I couldn't live outside my thermoskin bag in a Martian night, at least without a fire. And things got worse in a hurry. They cornered us in an angle between two mounds, and there we stood. I hadn't fired, nor had Tweel. There wasn't any use in irritating the brutes. They stopped a little distance away and began their booming about friendship and ouches. Then things got still worse. A barrel brute came out with a push cart, and they all grabbed into it and came out with handfuls of foot-long copper darts, sharp-looking ones, and all of a sudden one sailed past my ear. Zing! And it was shoot or die then. We were doing pretty well for a while. We picked off the ones next to the push cart and managed to keep the darts at a minimum. But suddenly there was a thunderous booming of friends and ouches and a whole army of them came out of their hole. Man, we were through and I knew it. Then I realized that Tweel wasn't. He could have leapt the mound behind us as easily as not. He was staying for me. Say, I could have cried if there had been time. I'd liked Tweel from the first, but whether I'd have had gratitude to do what he was doing. Suppose I had saved him from the first dream beast. He'd done as much for me, hadn't he? I grabbed his arm and said, Tweel, and pointed up, and he understood. He said, No, 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 Tick, and popped away with his glass pistol. What could I do? I'd be a goner anyway when the sun set, but I couldn't explain that to him. I said, Thanks, Tweel, you're a man, and felt that I wasn't paying him any compliment at all. A man. There are mighty few men who do that. So I went bang with my gun, and Tweel went puff with his, and the barrels were throwing darts and getting ready to rush us, and booming about being friends. I had given up hope. Then suddenly an angel dropped right down from heaven in the shape of Poots, with his underjets blasting the barrels into very small pieces. Wow! I let out a yell and dashed for the rocket. Poots opened the door and in I went, laughing and crying and shouting. It was a moment or so before I remembered Tweel. I looked around in time to see him rising in one of his nose dives over the mound and away. I had a devil of a job arguing Poots into following. By the time we got the rocket aloft, darkness was down. You know how it comes here, like turning off a light. We sailed out over the desert and put down once or twice. I yelled Tweel, and yelled it a hundred times, I guess. We couldn't find him. He could travel like the wind, and all I got, or else I imagined it, was a faint trilling and twittering drifting out of the south. He'd gone, and damn it, I wish, I wish he hadn't. The four men of the Ares were silent, even the sardonic Harrison. At last little Roy broke the stillness. I should like to see, he murmured. Yeah, said Harrison, and the wart cure. Too bad you missed that. It might be the cancer cure they've been hunting for a century and a half. Oh, that, muttered Jarvis gloomily. That's what started the fight. He drew a glistening object from his pocket. Here it is. End of A Martian Odyssey by Stanley G. Weinbaum A Martian Odyssey by Stanley G. Weinbaum This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite A Martian Odyssey by Stanley G. Weinbaum Jarvis stretched himself as luxuriously as he could in the cramped general quarters of the Ares. Air you can breathe, he exulted. It feels as thick as soup after the thin stuff out there. He nodded at the Martian landscape stretching flat and desolate in the light of the nearer moon beyond the glass of the port. The other three stared at him sympathetically. Putz, the engineer, Leroy, the biologist, and Harrison, the astronomer and captain of the expedition. Dick Jarvis was chemist of the famous crew, the Ares expedition. First human beings to set foot on the mysterious neighbor of Earth, the planet Mars. This, of course, was in the old days, less than twenty years after the mad American Doney perfected the atomic blast at the cost of his life, and only a decade after the equally mad Cardozo rode it to the moon. They were true pioneers, these four of the Ares, except for a half-dozen moon expeditions in the ill-fated Delancey flight aimed at the seductive orb of Venus. They were the first men to feel other gravity than Earth's, and certainly the first successful crew to leave the Earth-Moon system. 
And they deserve that success when one considers the difficulties and discomforts, the months spent in acclimatization chambers back on Earth, learning to breathe the air as tenuous as that of Mars, the challenging of the void in the tiny rocket driven by the cranky reaction motors of the 21st century, and mostly the facing of an absolutely unknown world. Jarvis stretched and fingered the raw and peeling tip of his frost-bitten nose. He sighed again contentedly. Well, exploded Harrison abruptly, are we going to hear what happened? You set out all shipshape in an auxiliary rocket, we don't get a peep for ten days, and finally Poots here picks you out of a lunatic ant heap with a freak ostrich as your pal. Spill it, man! Spiel? queried Leroy perplexedly. Spiel what? It means spiel, explained Poots soberly. It is to tell. Jarvis met Harrison's amused glance without the shadow of a smile. That's right, Carl, he said in grave agreement with Boots. Ich spiel es. He grunted comfortably and began. According to orders, he said, I watched Carl here take off toward the north, and then I got into my flying sweatbox and headed south. You'll remember, Cap, we had orders not to land, but just scout about for points of interest. I set the two cameras clicking and buzzed along, riding pretty high, about two thousand feet, for a couple of reasons. First, it gave the cameras a greater field, and second, the underjets travel so far in this half-vacuum they call air here that they stir up dust if you move low. We know all that from Poots, grunted Harrison. I wish you'd saved the films, though. They'd have paid for the cost of this junket. Remember how the public mobbed the first moon pictures? The films are safe, retorted Jarvis. Well, he resumed, as I said, I buzzed along at a pretty good clip. Just as we figured, the wings haven't much lift in this air at less than a hundred miles per hour, and even then I had to use the underjets. So with the speed and the altitude and the blurring caused by the underjets, the seeing wasn't any too good. I could see enough, though, to distinguish that what I sailed over was just more of this gray plane that we'd been examining the whole week since our landing. Same blobby growths and the same eternal carpet of crawling little plant animals, or biopods as Leroy calls them. So I sailed along calling back my position every hour as instructed, and not knowing whether you heard me. I did, snapped Harrison. A hundred and fifty miles south, continued Jarvis imperturbably, the surface changed to a sort of low plateau, nothing but desert and orange-tinted sand. I, I figured that we were right in our guess then, and this gray plane we dropped on was really the Mare Cimmerium which would make my orange desert the region called Xanthus. If I were right, I ought to hit another gray plain, the Mare Cronium, in another couple of hundred miles, and then another orange desert, Thule one or two. And so I did. Poots verified our position a week and a half ago, grumbled the captain. Let's get to the point. Coming, remarked Jarvis. Twenty miles into Thule, believe it or not, I crossed a canal. Poots photographed a hundred. Let's hear something new. And did he also see a city? Twenty of them, if you call those heaps of mud cities. Well, observed Jarvis, from here on I'll be telling a few things Poots didn't see. He rubbed his tingling nose and continued. I knew that I had sixteen hours of daylight at this season, so eight hours, eight hundred miles from here, I decided to turn back. I was still over Thule, whether one or two, I'm not sure, not more than twenty-five miles into it. And right there, Poots's pet motor quit. Quit? How? Poots was solicitous. The atomic blast got weak. I started losing altitude right away, and suddenly there I was with a thump, right in the middle of Thule. Smashed my nose on the window, too. He rubbed the injured member ruefully. Did you maybe try washing their combustion chamber mit acid sulfuric? inquired Poots. Sometimes their leads gives a secondary radiation. Nah, said Jarvis disgustedly. I wouldn't try that. Of course, not more than ten times. Besides, the bump flattened the landing gear and busted off the underjets. Suppose I got the thing working. What then? Ten miles with the blast coming right out of the bottom, I'd have melted the floor from under me. He rubbed his nose again. Lucky for me, a pound only weighs